now. It's starting to look a little bit better now. I'm starting to get a feel like something's happening. I think this is, uh, this is actually pretty amazing. And all you're seeing is the wall, but we're this close. This is really going to happen, and the conversation is going to start now. It's 420. This is THC Live. This is legit. This feels real. This is uh, this is a TV show. This is THC Live. This looks this good. This is THC Live. This is the best. Okay, I'm liking this a lot. I've seen in a while. I'm liking sure. this a lot. It feels comfortable. We got nice chairs. We got a nice looking set. Oh, it, this is a comfy chair. It feels good. Good afternoon, everyone. Good evening, depending on where you are. Of course, uh, 4:20 uh, Pacific time is when we hit uh, Facebook Live uh, every Thursday from here on out. Uh, you'll be able to catch us. On, I'm Shane Foxman. I'm Nikita Graham, and welcome to THC Live. Uh, I'll tell you what. The, the place looks uh, the place looks wicked. Uh, the place looks fantastic, and uh, I have a hunch the show is going to uh, uh, live up to the expectations created by this beautiful studio uh, and set. Um, Tell the folks, they're going to be able to communicate with us during the show, ask questions. You guys can. So I have my cell phone here with me, and so we're going to be taking questions from you guys, the viewers at home. So you're welcome to write down questions, and after each guest, we will be going we'll to your questions. Yeah. We'll open it up, and you guys can see some answers for yourself. Exactly. So let's give you a sense of uh, what the show is about. Uh, obviously, THC Live. We're here to kind of uh, spread the truth. And uh, it doesn't matter what side of the issue you're on, there is only one truth. And, and that's what we're going to try to do. Get rid of the misconceptions, uh, all the falsehoods that are out there, the fake news, if I can steal a line uh, yeah. from uh, someone south of the border. We want to educate you guys all at home so you can make your decision. Exactly. Look, uh, decriminalization, uh, legalization, it is coming. Uh, right now the date is July of 2018, and there's a lot to get to before that date arrives. If you're someone who wants to take advantage of the situation, you're going to need to know what the rules are. If you're someone that doesn't want any part of it, you also need to know uh, what the rules are. Uh, guests on the show tonight, we're very excited from the Liberal government, uh, the MP from Cloverdale, Surrey, Langley City, John, uh, uh, John Aldag will join us live in studio. We'll talk to him about where the government's at as far as uh, the legalization goes. We also have two amazing advocates that are here today. We have Don Breer and Carol Wilt. And both of them are going to be speaking on behalf of their experiences throughout the years. They've been uh, serious supporters of marijuana and yeah, they kind of want to give you their side of the story as well. And have they sacrificed? A uh, fascinating story. You'll hear from uh, Don and Carol and also uh, Tom Littlewood. Uh, obviously a lot of concern about uh, keeping uh, drugs, no matter what the drugs are, out of the hands of children. Uh, Tom Littlewood uh, works on the front lines with uh, at-risk youth. Uh, he's going to join us uh, in studio as well and we'll get his thoughts on the upcoming uh, legalization and get see what his concerns are uh, as well. Uh, in the meantime though, we should probably take a look back, don't you think? We have some history and it's going to be a segment that we post every single Thursday and it is called Growing Pains. <laughs> According to Gallup, in the early 2000s, only 30% of U.S. citizens favored the legalization of cannabis. By 2016, the number favoring legalization had jumped to 60%. Recently, Seattle dispensary owner John Davis said medical marijuana pulls higher than apple pie. Why the change? He knocks closure. He's right on the nose. No doubt a number of factors have contributed to the change in public sentiment. Increased awareness of drug cartel violence, increased consciousness of medical uses, failure of the war on drugs. What is the history of cannabis prohibition and who was Mackenzie King? How exactly did we get here? I want to know absolutely everything that's happened up to now. Well, let's see. First, the earth cooled. Maybe skip ahead a bit. In the 1600s, cannabis textiles were needed by all of Europe's naval powers for ropes and sails. In the New World, tracts of land were given to settlers who promised to grow cannabis for fiber. 
Canada's first cannabis crop was planted in 1606, and by the mid-1600s, Britain made cannabis farming mandatory in all of New England. In Canada, the French government pressured colonists to grow as much as possible. To encourage this, colonists were allowed to pay taxes with hemp stocks. The names of many towns and villages were derived from their cultivation of cannabis. Unfortunately for governments, colonists, well, they preferred to grow food they could eat instead of cannabis for taxes and textiles. In the early 1700s, Canada's beaver trade in New France collapsed. Nice beaver. Thank you. I just had it stuffed. Let me help you with that. Administrator Michel Begon tried to revive the economy by growing more cannabis to export to France. The renewed emphasis on cannabis was unpopular with the Catholic Church since priests earned their wages via tithes from farmers. Food crops could be tithed, cannabis could not. Britain took control of Canada from France in 1763. The Navy needed even more cannabis. Governor James Murray brought Germans and Russians over to settle and raise cannabis. In 1801, Napoleon soldiers discover hashish during the invasion of Egypt. They took it back to Europe when they returned home. By 1822, the Parliament of Upper Canada was investing in hemp processing machinery. An 1823 law allowed duty-free importation of hemp mills from the U.S. Over the next 100 years, cannabis would be grown in every province from Nova Scotia to B.C. By the late 1800s, steam-powered engines and the cotton gin reduced the importance of cannabis. In 1893, the Indian Hemp Drug Commission published an eight-volume study commissioned by the British government which stated that moderate use of hemp drugs is practically attended by no evil results at all. Well, who didn't see that coming? Nevertheless, with opium use spreading, drug prohibition in Canada began with the Opium Act of 1908, which was introduced by then Deputy Minister of Labour Mackenzie King. Thirty years later, King famously said, it is what we prevent rather than what we do that counts most in government. See, you learn something new. Uh, every week, episode one of uh, Growing Pains. I did I not love know that. It. I know it's very in informative. See, that's and that's what we're here for, right? To break down uh, some of the misconceptions and mistruths, and, and kind of get to the facts and. With that in mind, let's join our first guest on uh, THC Live. We're very fortunate to have a member of the Liberal government, a uh, member of parliament, of course, for uh, Cloverdale, Surrey, Langley City. John Aldag joins us. John, thanks very much for coming in. We appreciate it. My pleasure Welcome. to be here. Uh, let me just ask you first. You were part of the, uh, the sweep across the country as the Liberals uh, kind of took office. How much of a role do you think the platform of the party to legalize marijuana played in the party's win? Sure. Well, I've had um, some uh, constituents who have said that it was a, a core part of, uh, of their reason for supporting our government. Uh, many people have, have seen that the, uh, the um, prohibition that we've uh, been facing for many years simply hasn't worked, us, worked and, uh, and that's why they supported us. So it, it was important. I think we had a lot of other things we also ran on, but uh, it was one of our, uh, our key platform promises and we're working on delivering that now. Now, July 2018 seems to be the the, the date now people are talking about it. It's kind of been a moving target. How difficult has this been to navigate through? Well, yeah, legislative challenges, uh, timelines are always a, a bit of a challenge. And, uh, you know, but um, we are working on it. Uh, the uh, the uh, legislation was debated uh, before we rose for the summer. And uh, we'll continue. Uh, there's committee hearings right now happening in Ottawa, which is part of that legislative process. Um, there were uh, chiefs of police in uh, talking to the health committee this week. And, um, and so it will continue on. It will come back for third reading sometime uh, in the, uh, the fall or winter uh, calendar. Um, it still needs to go to the Senate and go through their process. So it's a very aggressive timeline for, for legislation. But uh, it's also important that we get on. Uh, so yeah, we're, we're working to, uh, to try and meet that deadline of, of next summer. That's very cool. Yeah, I, I'm just gonna say, how much of a work in progress is it? Like every time you meet, is there another idea, another change, or things that you didn't foresee? No, I think that the, um, the, the people that have really been uh, leading the discussion on this, um, 
have uh, really benefited from work that a, a task force did. Uh, so we had a, a special group that went out and talked to Canadians, looked at best practices internationally, and uh, so there was a really good uh, kind of blueprint of how we could proceed. I think that uh, the government, the executive branch, uh, including the ministers of justice and health, were able to take the, uh, the recommendations, many of them, from that task force, and, and really that's what's guiding the legislation. So uh, it's not like we're starting from scratch. There, there was a lot of work done in advance, and uh, we are able to build on other uh, jurisdictions that have gone before us, um, although nobody has uh, done it uh, you know, on, on a national scale like we're doing, um, and uh, at least you know, not in North America. We haven't seen it, obviously. And uh, so, so it is a, a work in progress. As I say, the, the committees, as they hear from witnesses, will be able to... Um, perhaps make recommendations to the government on how to fine-tune it. But I think we have the, uh, the essence of, of, of a good piece of legislation to, uh, to start the discussion with Canadians. So do we think that it's going to be rolling by... Uh, you, ma you made a comment that it was possible there was talk about it coming out on Canada Day, but it's getting pushed back. Do you think it's going to actually be on time, do we think? Or? Yeah, well, I, you know, I, I hope so. We, we've made uh, this commitment to, to do it. Uh, as I mentioned, as we were chatting beforehand, that there's uh, you know, a question if Canada Day is the right day because we could end up with Cannabis Day, yeah. and, and that's not take away from the, the special nature of July 1st. And so uh, if we miss July 1st and it goes to another day over the summer, I, I'd be fine with that. Um, but you know, there are a lot of, of parts at play here right now. The other important part is that the federal government has one role in this, and that is essentially the legalization. When it gets into a lot of the details of things that I get asked about by constituents, everything from where will I be able to buy it and what are the cons, can I grow, the cons, can I grow all of it, like, some of those details will actually um, have to come from the provinces because of the constitutional jurisdiction. Does that not bring up an issue though? Like, Shouldn't the rules be the same if, yeah, I, live in, the board, if yeah. I live in Halifax Nova Scotia or I live in Vernon, BC, I shouldn't be maybe treated differently when it comes to something like that kind of opens up other possibilities for problems. Right. I think that the, you know, the, the, the response I have to that is it, it treated as uh, kind of uh, equivalent to alcohol. If, uh, if that's a fair example, um, where the provinces do set their rules, and so they have uh, you know controls, age limits differ yeah. across the country. So we may see that with cannabis, quite frankly. Um, I th believe the draft legislation right now says 18, but we could have jurisdictions that decide 19. I know that there are bodies, uh, such as you know some of the medical community, are saying that that um, is still too young. Maybe 21 is the right age, and so we we may end up with uh, differences across the country just like we have with alcohol. Do, when you talk about the ages, and I know here in BC uh, and in Vancouver, uh, there was the, the concerns about being near schools. Oh, yeah. I, I'm in my 50s. When I was like 14, 15, and I was going to school, you could get it anywhere. Mm. And it's pretty much the same now. Like, I, I just wonder how much time and effort gets put into talking, and, and not to downplay the importance of protecting children. But children can, like kids can get it now it, whenever yeah, they want they now. Want like it's not hard. Yeah. It's not one of those things that we're just bringing into the uh, to consumers. It's right. been around forever already. And I just wonder how much effort are we putting into the, uh, and again whether it's the rules regarding schools or everything else, uh, young people, the ages. When, when kids are doing it all over the place right now. Right. But, you know, I think that's one of the things to understand is that uh, that's a, a key driver behind this. We know that the evidence is out there says that uh, cannabis does have negative effects on the developing mind. We know that Canada has the highest level of cannabis use in the industrialized world, and despite it being illegal in many right. of those jurisdictions. And so our public policy has failed. And so we're trying to rethink this. How do we actually protect our youth? And you're right, there are going to be uh, some that get access to it. You know, there, there are um, bootleggers for alcohol, and there may be bootleggers, but that's where this legislation <clears throat> actually includes fairly strict penalties and, 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 frankly, punishments for those who provide that bootlegging service. Um, so, you know, the idea is that we want to protect our youth. We want to make it more difficult for them to have access to it. Um, and, uh, and, and for, you know, the, uh, the mechanisms that uh, pop up like bootlegging, uh, there'll be punishment to go with that. On the, you know, where it's distributed, yeah. again, that's probably going to be a, a provincial or even municipal jurisdiction. There's so, so many levels. There's so many people there, get involved in it. it. As you probably are well aware, the more chefs in the kitchen, uh, the more trouble there is kind of turning the recipe around. I, I, that's what concerns from the outside looking in. I think, oh my God, if I had federal, provincial, and municipal politicians all involved in the process, 
how much red tapes are going to be. Yeah, and, and that's where it's really critical that the federal government do its part now uh, because we really are the, the, the lead step in this whole um, public policy discussion. We need to deal with the, the legalization. We need to take it out of the criminal code before anybody else can do any of these other pieces. And uh, that's why we have an aggressive piece. Now, you know, just uh, when I talk about next July, um, we, our process may be finished, but there's still a lot of work that needs to happen from the other jurisdictions. So will there be uh, distribution channels? Will there, Ontario has announced that they'll have something equivalent to the liquor distribution system, and uh, uh, they'll have their cannabis stores, much like there's a liquor store in Ontario. Um, will that be in place by July? It's hard to say because everything needs to come together. And, but right now, our piece, the federal piece, is really the, the lead piece uh, so that um, you know, we can set the rules on, on what's allowed, what's not allowed, and then the other jurisdictions will be able to layer their role on top of it. Well, before we let uh, John go, usually people could ask him questions. Yeah, normally we're going to have questions after every guest. So, unfortunately, Tom is a very, very, John, <laughs> John is a very, very busy man. So he has to leave and, and head over. Every t it's okay. It happens. So in he's got future, a very important though, yes. meeting. But in the future, we will be taking um, your live questions. So... The next guest, and you'll have uh, an opportunity to listen to the show for that, sure. So. And, you know, and if I, uh, if you'd like to have me back, if I could help, oh, I'd be sure. more than happy to. Oh, you're uh, going to be our voice uh, in Ottawa. Yeah, you're going to be able yeah. to keep our us in the loop, talk voice, to uh, totally. to your viewers, and, and take questions because it's going to be really important that we have this kind of open discussion with Canadians in the coming months. That we address the concerns that are coming up and, and let people know that we've given thought to the the various aspects of this because it, it is complex. It's a huge change, and we want to get it right. All right, John. Thanks so much for your time today and being our uh, our first guest. Yes, THC. Thank you. Really appreciate thank it. You. Thanks for uh, for uh, taking this uh, this topic out there to Canadians. Well, no problem. Thank you so much, John. Uh, now, time for uh, something that we call uh, Canifax. Facebook. No, my mic's on, so it can't be me. So, okay, it's not me. Anyway, Dana Larson is on next week. There we go. Okay, and we are uh, back. I don't know if my mic's working. Is my mic working at all? Anybody? At I'm good now. Okay. The key to please. So we are actually very excited to announce Don and Carol are here joining us live. They're huge advocates. They're doing a lot for, they've been doing a lot over the years um, to see a change in uh, marijuana in BC in Canada to get the you know get it rolling and so we're really no excited pun intended. to have you. Yeah. Oh. No pun intended. Didn't even think of that, but it presented itself. How could you pass it up? Uh, That's a good one. I like that. Let me ask you just first off, why does this matter to you so much? Well, first and foremost, we know that the laws were wrong. Uh, we we seen all kinds of people consuming it when we were younger that were older than us and uh, there was no issues or problems and then uh, it, it turned out to be a very dangerous drug because of legislation so you know we've been fighting or not really standing up for our rights for uh, 27 years 28 years now it would have been easy Carol at some point uh, you know and again we'll get into you know you've you, you've run afoul with the law it would have been easy to just go okay you know what, I can still enjoy the product on my own without having to be front and center in the, as you say, not the fight necessarily, in leading the stand. Yeah. Uh, why? People are going to jail for this. People are being criminalized every day. Um, even just since Justin Trudeau took power and said that he was going to end this war, 60,000 people have been arrested, over 60,000 people in this country for simple possession. So we're being criminalized for our personal choice to use a safe therapeutic medication or recreational uh, product, however you see it. And um, that's not fair. We're, we're harmless, peaceful people. There's millions of us across this country that choose cannabis as an alternative to alcohol or any other kind of substance they could take because it's safe and it's non-toxic and nobody's ever died from cannabis. It's a very foundational issue. It's based on ignorance and racism and it, it needs to end. And if we don't stand up, then you know we can't expect somebody else to stand up for us. 
Uh, I would imagine it's like pushing a, a boulder up a hill for the last number of decades. Uh, Pretty what much. Keeps, what <laughs> keeps you getting out of bed to do it? Well, it's just the fact that it, it works so well for me. Um, I was fed pharmaceuticals. Uh, I was in intensive care for 11 days at a great cost to our uh, uh, medical system. And in the end, they found out it was uh, the Lipidor that I was taking. It uh, shut down my liver. All we had to do was take, it off, take me off of it, and all of a sudden, within a couple of weeks, I, I was rehealed. And, and the other thing that I, I, I can say that the cannabis really helped. Yeah, there's a lot of proven science behind it. There's so much decades of, of science behind it. And a lot of science has been suppressed because of prohibition. So uh, it's time to bring it into the light for you. Yeah, yeah. I, I was going to say, because you mentioned uh, information suppressed. Why do you think that is? Why has there been such a, you know what I mean? You can go anywhere and buy pills, your pharmaceutical booze, companies. Because you can buy booze anywhere. It's taxed. And I always thought over the years, cannabis grows why wouldn't freely. the government legalize it, tax it? There's a lot of revenue to be had there. Absolutely. And yeah, there's the lobbyists. Uh, first, uh, again, it was used against the uh, war protesters in the in the early days. Instead of moving it down to uh, a schedule, uh, was it schedule one? Uh, they, they, they moved it up to, to equal as heroin. And so uh, and then, uh, you know, the, the whole uh, industrial uh, complex for jailing and uh, courts and the police systems, uh, they were using it to uh, yeah. um, gather up funds. And uh, every time they seized a vehicle or, or monies or anything like that, they put it into their operational budget. So it was being encouraged, really, to uh, uh, up the war and keep it running as opposed to ending it. And in the end, we find out that it's so dangerous and it hurts so many people. Thousands and thousands of people have been severely injured in this drug war. By the criminalization of it, not by the drug itself. Right, yes. yeah. And it's interesting, because yeah. sitting here with you guys, you guys seem like very wonderful people. And we heard that you yourselves were put in jail for marijuana-related charges. Yeah, I call and it peace before it's time, but yeah. 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 Well, well, and I, I can't imagine those of us that haven't had that experience uh, what, what was that like for you? For, for me, um, I, I, I How didn't, much time did you, did you, did you I, I was sentenced to 17 months, um, in, so I did eight and a half months um, in provincial uh, prison, and then uh, I did eight and a half months on parole, which was very strict and like being in prison. But, yeah. um, but um, you know what? When I, when I was arrested and then further on convicted of my crimes, then... I knew I was going to go to jail, and I knew I was a peaceful person, and I didn't do anything wrong, and so I just held my head high and just took it as, a, you know, going to India on kind of an ex exploration trip. <laughs> a little or, scarier, though, little, I would yeah. think. I, I, that's the one that concerned me. I get but having it wasn't, the moral stance. But, but it, wasn't. It, it wasn't. It was lonely, but it wasn't scary. I mean, these are people, 85% of the people in jail are there for, for drug problems and, you know, crimes caused by, by drug problems and whatnot. A huge uh, First Nation population in our prisons and it's 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 really appalling and that they're not getting the help that they need in these prisons and and so I just took it upon myself to, to you know carry my way through that and I, I, I took a lot out of it and I, I, I carried to this day a lot of the lessons that I learned from prison so it seems like it strengthened yeah. your resolve as opposed to weakness. absolutely uh, absolutely uh, you know like I said if I don't stand up for myself who's gonna stand up for me and and there's a lot of people that cannot stand up for themselves because they're they're so marginalized by this point in, in their lives that they need that. And what about you, Don? Well, the, the, the thing is, we are, we're standing up for our rights. And, and we looked at the laws and we, we knew that they were wrong. They were completely, totally wrong. So we operated outside the law. We were outlaws. And so we, we had families, we had people we were taking care of. Uh, but you knew you were breaking the law. Well, the thing is, no, but the, the, if, if on, our, on our side of the fence, we look at it from the point is the law was broken. The law was wrong. Enforcing laws based on lies is misuse of our tax resources. And that's criminal, especially if you use willful blindness to look away from the evidence that is there. And so we're standing up for our rights. And, and just like anybody else, uh, we are so fortunate that we have such a great democracy and we have good people here. I find it amazing, though, that you guys still, you know, you keep going regardless of all that. What's some back history of, like, how do you guys get into this in kind of the beginning? What was, was there well, a change in time that all of a sudden? I met Don just after he, he, he was actually on a day parole for um, 
after, well, a four, after a four year, <laughs> four year sentence for cultivation of marijuana. So he did that time and then he was right. on day parole and that's when I met him. I wanted to open up a compassion club and his name came up to me and so we met and then we started the Decline Cafe on Commercial Drive yeah. a year after we met. Um, it was uh, a place, the, basically the first place in North America where you could buy your um, cannabis over, over the counter with uh, ID over 19. I, I recall the popularity of that place is what did you in there. Yeah, that's what did us in. Lineups was, around uh, the block. The <laughs> block I, I, I remember living in the neighborhood and going, are they giving away something free there? Why is there <laughs> such a big lineup? Or they make really good cookies. Yeah. <laughs> we had that too. Yeah. The rest we had it all too. there, really. We had ginger yeah. snaps with the extra snap. Yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> and then we had, we had uh, a fan blowing out the door, and it was like a continuous line of smoke going right out the door. Conti people could walk by and just get high. <laughs> when, when the current Liberal government was elected, yeah. and you heard during the campaign, and you heard Justin Trudeau talk about decriminalization, about legalization, legalization yeah. what was your... I, I'm wondering if you were optimistic then, are you still optimistic now? Has it changed from the time you heard them talk about it to where we are now? Well, a lot of people voted uh, for the Liberals because of the talk yeah. of uh, decriminalization right away I mean, and legalization. He's, he's of the age. He does know better, right? And so we thought, okay, here's a guy that's going to do better, too. And, uh, you, you, and, you know, there's been over 250 um, raids on cannabis dispensaries since he took power. So he's knocking out a lot of jobs. for He's not. The, the police right. are doing it, but it's because yeah, of the Yeah, so the orders are coming um, from the top, this, right? This industry employs thousands and thousands of people like a lot of thousands of people across the country, yeah. right? and they're very and, knowledgeable um, and know what they're doing. For instance, our company, we employ over 100 and pe 150 people. So, you know, that's a lot of jobs. That's direct jobs, and the indirect that, jobs are usually double to three that times very, that amount. You know, the future is uncertain for, for people who work in dispensaries right. right now across Canada. They're, they're raiding on a daily basis in Toronto right and now. What, what I don't understand is... is uh, now, Mr. Trudeau came out and said, well, you know, my dad had the influence and the money, and so he got my brother off on charges. Yeah. Well, why is he still criminalizing 60,000 people and raiding dispensaries? These people rely on this because, again, I was, I was very ill. I, I had uh, uh, my liver was shutting down, and it was pharmaceuticals that I had taken mm -hmm. at a great cost to being in the hospital for in, in intensive care for 11 days before they found out it was what, the drugs that I was taking. So... I, I, Don Brier, uh, Carol Gwilta joining us on the show, uh, uh, marijuana advocates for uh, uh, decades. And we told you earlier we were going to take questions uh, yes. from you, the viewer, if you had comments, you had questions for Don and Carol. Uh, do we have something, uh, Nikita? We actually, we have an email question. Oh, and wow. this is from Sarah from Ontario. And she's wondering, like, I guess another question, like how you, like what your real, real passion and your reason to continue the fight. Because it's wrong. And 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 and, uh, freedom. and freedom and democracy, freedom. and we have freedom. the right. You go go to several countries where where the, the laws are so repressive and, and people are pushed down. We, we for democracy to survive, you have to be vigilant every single day. You have to keep fighting, and I, I don't want to use the word fighting, but you have to keep standing up for your rights. You have to keep standing all the time. And this is what we're doing. We're standing for everybody, mm -hmm. especially the people who do not consume cannabis, because this drug war is so costly. 1.2 million kids going to bed hungry every day. Our soldiers are living in the streets. Why, why are we doing this to ourselves? Uh, listen, it's amazing how quickly the time goes by. Uh, yeah. Uh, Don Brier, Carol Gould, thank you so much for being with us uh, today, and Avalanche will be speaking to you again uh, in the weeks that come. But, but thanks for sharing your story, and, and we appreciate thanks you. Thanks for having us on. Yeah, Congratulations yeah, yeah. on your new show. Yeah, shows. on your new thank show. You. It's fantastic. This is pretty cool for our community to have an unbiased kind of yeah, well, approach we, to it. We just try to walk know, down the line. We know the exactly. truth, yeah. Right? Yeah. And to educate people, right? That's, That's right. This point. is what it's all about, education. Uh, we've had a number of guests so far. We've had a uh, member of parliament. We've had a couple of uh, marijuana, long-time marijuana advocates. Uh, now to kind of switch the conversation a little bit as we continue on THC Live to bring you as many different sides, as many different opinions, as many different thoughts on the whole legalization of marijuana and marijuana in our uh, society. And we are joined here today with Tom Littlewood. And you've been doing some amazing things over the past few years, and we'd love to... Look, you work with at youth, uh, at, at risk youth. Uh, you're on the front line. So, when you first, let me ask you this, Tom. When you first hear that the government is considering or is moving towards legalization, 
what's your gut, your first reaction? You're on the front lines. Well, I've been waiting for this from the 60s. <laughs> <laughs> so, but I mean, it, I think it's a great thing because the stigma around it is some of the things that attract the young people to it. And well, because you can't have it, you want it. That's right. Yeah. Church on time makes me party, right? Right. <laughs> but we've got this... Uh, I mean, nobody wants it happening for kids. You know, we, everyone's talking 19, 20, 18. Some people are saying 25. I think having it at a reasonable age is really important because they're going to get it anyway. Oh, I mean, Tom? I've never seen a short supply with the kids I work with. Apparently you're having. Uh, apparently you're having. Apparently you're having some trouble with your mic. I'm going over here this while we while we work on your mic, and maybe TV. it'll pick up on mine, Tom. <laughs> okay. How about that? How can you can you hear Tom then, now? Too. Is that better? Can you hear Tom now on my mic? Uh, how, anybody, how is that going? Is anyone talking to me? Okay, it's good. Okay. Okay. So Tom, while well, we work on your mic, as we were asking you, uh, what what then would be the ideal? What is the ideal age? Or it, again, everyone's different. Is there such a thing as an ideal age? Well, I think with, with youth, I think it's best uh, 18, 19. It's, that's reasonable. It's not going to stop 16-year-olds from smoking it. Well, I mean, and, 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 but that's it's an gonna, interesting point. It's inevitable, point. too. It's, yeah. really, it's going to happen if it's... But I think that the, the more the conversation happens around it without the stigma around, of it, around it, we're going to have young people being able to make more reasonable decisions on it. I think that a lot of the different places that have legalized it, they watch the use of in adolescence go down. There's nothing turns a kid off more than watching his dad smoke up. You know, he wants to do something else all of a right. sudden. You know, he doesn't want what his dad's doing. So a lot of that attraction is gone. Um, we're dealing with a different plant, though, than what we started with. Uh, I mean. Oh, you mean like when, well, I'm going to move back because your mic works, okay. but are you talking about, oh, I think it's okay, Nikita. Are you talking here. about the, the strength of what we're, what we're using, the pot's different than it was 25, 35 years ago? Well, artificial selection. You know, you have a wolf and then you have a chihuahua. And the chihuahua, th chihuahua thinks it's a wolf, right? It's the other way with pot. Cannabis has gone from a chihuahua to a wolf. We used to have about 50-50. CBD, THC within the content of your average cannabis and the amount of the psychoactive ingredients was much less. They've basically done some amazing developments for, a, you know, a 12 foot outdoor plant is now this big in a biker's basement, right? So right. it's, it, they've really changed the plant. They've really changed what it is. And when they broke the bond between THC and CBD, so they were able to increase THC to the place where they have it today, that is a real problem. And, uh, and, and, and then you've got products like Shatter and Dab and all these other products that are really high levels of THC with none of the CBD, which is the mellow part, to mediate the, right. the high. So when you've got a young mind that is still developing, smoking, dab or shatter or some of these really high THC strains, um, that's a problem because they have a developing brain and the number one cause of psychosis in youth in Canada is THC psychosis. And, and, uh, but it's, 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 it's not the danger of the, the plant, it's the danger of what we've done to the plant. How are you using it? So a lot of the kids I work with, I'm not, obviously I'm not anti-pot, I, I just look right. at them I say, do I look like I'm anti-pot? Right. <laughs> I don't use the product myself. I have some more natural ways of doing it, and I really hate paying a dealer to get right. those natural ways. But I tell them, when you go to a dispensary, ask for a product that is 50-50 THC CBD, and you'll have a lot more mellow experience. You're not going to have this high kind of paranoid kind of experience. Because they mix this stuff, they, they smoke this high-end stuff, and then they do something like E or... Special K or these other drugs. It's the mixture. And yeah. then the combination takes them right through the roof, or sometimes just some of the stuff the doctors have them on, you know, prescribing. And you get a tug of war between, uh, you know, a local dispensary and the psychiatrist, and the kids trying to get high, and the psychiatrist is trying to bring them down, and the medications counter interact. And so it's not a, a good formula. So a lot more education has to be done, is what I'm saying. Would you consider it to be harmful? for 
Youth, because there's well, some 20, talk. What if you're 23? Is it harmful or not? But there's some talk too with kids that have medical ailments and problems, and they're using um, marijuana in some kind of form, where it's CBD or oils and things like that. And mm -hmm. I've heard stories of kids that have epilepsy. Oh, absolutely! And now, it's so a miracle drug, and for PD, PST, uh, post-traumatic stress disorder, it's a miracle drug. For uh, chemo uh, sickness and uh, nausea around that, it's a miracle drug. It, this is, I mean, I believe these herbs were given to us and uh, there's, we don't have cannabis receptors in our brain by accident. We've evolved with these plants for thousands and thousands of years. And uh, the last thing I want a kid to believe is it's evil. You know, the Nixon, Reagan mentality, right. just say no. I, I want them to ask, you know, how, do you know it was, how it was growing? Was that clone, the baby, the baby clone, was it dipped in Avid? before it was sold to the Mr. Organic, and he grew it in his thing. And if he's got a $10,000 crop in his little grow room, and all of a sudden he has mites or fungus, Mr. Organic can change to Mr. Spray Can pretty quick. You right. know, he'll keep his stash clean, because he's Mr. Organic. <laughs> but nobody's gonna say $10,000 worth of pot, oh well. Right, you know, cost I mean, to do in business. Yeah, sorry, yeah, yeah sorry, I mean, this I, mean, is I bad hope bad. they would say that, <laughs> but right. I, I know the reality. So. Not only are, are you dealing with all these things, you're also dealing with pesticides, you're dealing with uh, uh, fungicides, you're dealing with molds, you're dealing with all these things. And I mean, I'm all for a really good, clean, regulated, you know, they know what the content of the THC, they know the content of the CBD, they, they know what's going on with the product. There's been no, it's, you know, organic, it hasn't been exposed to chemicals. At least you got a level playing field then. And then you can tell a kid, you know, it's your decision, but be wise. Let, let me ask you this, and you hear this all the time, because we're going to run out of time, and I need to know. I, I've heard marijuana described as the gateway drug, which I've never really believed, and I've heard it described also now as the exit drug. And, and you know, for those that are dealing with opi opioid and other issues, yep. and then maybe it's a way to, to get off. Is it both? Is it, e is it neither? Is it, again, does it all depend on the individual? It, yeah, uh, the gateway drug thing is basically, you know, the research was usually funded by the Attorney General's Department, right? right. You can validate what you want to find in any kind of research depending who funds it. Uh, I, I really believe it, it, it is a powerful way uh, to help people trying to get off of opioids. I think a suboxone approach is probably a better way. What I teach young people, if you self-regulate externally, drugs, alcohol, sex, gambling, gaming, etc. you're gonna have a problem. You need to self-regulate internally. If you're doing that accurately, smoking a joint is a lot better than drinking alcohol. Smoking a joint is a lot better than, you know, a prescription from a psychiatrist, unless they really need that prescription. But a lot of prescriptions are written basically without really dealing with what's going on in the kid's life. You know, four monster drinks a day and I'd need to be medicated, you know? I mean, and these kids are 7-Eleven, the psychiatrist, nobody's talking. Right. And, and, and then the other things start to happen, like pot use, just to so he feels alive again. Yeah. And uh, it's better if we get a pl level playing field, and that's what legalization is gonna do. Very cool, so we're, we're actually, we're getting some questions here from yes. uh, the, the viewers here that are live. Um, so we have a question from Camille here from Vancouver. And she's asking, what exactly is the risk to young people's brains by using too early? And is there evidence behind it? Well, we grow our, we were born with premature brains. Uh, every woman would die in childbirth if we were born with full-size brains. So we are born, that's why we have to be kind of cared for until we're about 13. At around 10 to 13, 15, our brains stop growing. But the next 10 years are all, uh, till 25 is when all the neural pathways are laid down and behaviors are learned and reinforced. It's called conditioning. So if they awake and bake and smoke all day long and they're trying to go to school, that's not going to be a good thing. Right. But if they have a smoke on the weekend, I don't think it's a big deal, especially if it's compared to drinking a whiskey, bottle of whiskey or whatever else they're going to do, right? So, I mean, it, 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 the, in the perfect world, no, wait till you're 25. But we don't live in a perfect world. Mm -hmm. Right, exactly. Do you any more? Yeah, we do. Oh, we awesome. have a question here from Mike. Um, this is an email question. He goes, won't there still be black market for cannabis to kids? Will that be policed more closely once legalization leaves more resources to find these dealers? 
I can't imagine it being policed any less. I mean, police love to police things, right? That's what they do, right? I started out as a police counselor, so I really understand the mentality behind that, and I think it should be. Uh, but I, you know, because again, it's not going to be the good stuff. It's going to be, you know, Mr. Doctor Doom in his basement, you know, growing this stuff and uh, and selling it to kids on the street. But I mean, in one of the schools I've worked in lately, uh, all the kids were standing outside and they had these e-cigarettes, yes. but the cartridges were all THC oil, right? And they completely had the teachers fooled. So it's. It's, uh, you know, kids are going to be kids, and I think this is probably the lowest risk that there is versus alcohol abuse, pharmaceutical, you know, stealing Oh, your stealing mom's things out of your parents' drug cabinet, exactly. You know, exactly. all that kind of stuff, right? Yeah. yeah. Uh, Tom, we are out of time. Thank you so much for yeah. coming no in. Problem. We really appreciate it. Uh, works with At Risk Youth, uh, part of Dan's legacy. Yes, that's uh, we, right. we appreciate you coming in, uh, Tom, and sharing uh, your expertise with us. Uh, we're going to take a look at uh, what's coming up uh, next week on THC Live. Uh, there we go. Uh, do we got to look at what's uh, coming up? Oh, there we see. Uh, Dana Larson, again, uh, well known in the world of uh, uh, marijuana and marijuana activism and author. He will join us uh, live in studio. And you're going to Toronto. I'm going to Toronto, so we're going to have a little special segment that comes live from T.O. for you I believe guys. they call that the big smoke, and again, oh. no pun intended whatsoever. <laughs> so that's uh, Thursday, next Thursday, September 21st, once again, uh, 420 Pacific time. Uh, you know what, that was a lot of fun for the first show. That was. We'd like to thank you guys all for tuning in and watching us here at THC Live. Yeah, a thank you to Don Brier, Carol Gwilt, of course, John Aldeg, the Liberal MP from Cloverdale, uh, Surrey Langley City, and of course, uh, Tom Littlewood uh, from uh, Dan's Legacy. Uh, Nikita, thank you so much. That was a thank lot of fun. Thank you, Shane. Thank you. Thank you all for all of you for uh, joining us and uh, taking part in the show, and we'll see you next Thursday. See you next Thursday.